Yeah, we're, we're good, you know, AKA Miss C, AKA Miss C. All right, however they want to, you want to I'm gonna go ahead and get us started for our uh, first program of 2023. Thank you for being here. One of our most important issues with our students and our staff has been maintaining mental health. We've been doing this forever and it's still something we wanna focus on. So today we brought together a group of fabulous women who are gonna help share what our district resources are, what we can keep an eye out for, what you as parents need to know and what you can take back to your parent organizations to share with them. So without further ado, um, it's Ms. Nidia Elm. She is a licensed, Okay, now I'm gonna have to look at it. <laughs> Marriage and family oh, therapist. therapist. <laughs> okay, and Miss C, because she will have to pronounce her own last name for you. Caro. Caro. <laughs> it's a crazy French last name. But it's a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful French last French name. name. <laughs> so, and we also have Lori Berman, who you know has pretty much been running this meeting. We love her. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. But she's gonna turn over her button to Kia. All right. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> they have their yeah. Hello. Hi, 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 hi. Do you want to come in too? Okay. So to change, okay, technology. So to change slides, can I just hit this or yes. do I have to tell no. you? Okay. So um, my name is Nidia Elm. I was asked to speak here today and you all know me as the social worker at Greenway Middle School. And yes, I am. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. Um, I've worked for agencies and been in private practice for a while. So I've been doing mental health for over 20 years. Um, and so when I was asked to speak, you may think like, oh, you know, she's gonna come and speak as a, with her expertise in the field. And yes, I am. I'm also a mom. I am a mom of two elementary school age children, one in second grade and one in fourth grade. And when I thought about how am I going to talk about mental health to a group of parents, I thought, you know what, in my heart as a professional, in my mind as a professional, I know that mental health is important. Um, in, in my whole body, I know that for my family personally, having mental health supports at our school has been pretty much life-changing. And it's been such a support to us. And so I'm going to speak to you from that lens with also the information of being a professional. Um, Patricia, I met a couple years ago when she came to the district and her brain work is absolutely amazing. So I'll let her tell you a little bit about her. My name is Patricia Caro, and I'm currently the social emotional learning specialist at Larkspur. Uh, previously, I had slash both hats between social work and uh, social emotional learning. Um, so this year I made the jump full time, but I'm still on loan, according to Carrie from the social work world um, to this. I have been a social worker. I'm actually from Canada. I came here for a position in this district. Uh, working a structured program based on the training in neuroscience that I have. So my specialty in social work is based in neuroscience, which is a very interesting lens to look at children through. Um, and for those of you who've heard Bernie Brown talk about the fact that children or people always present themselves on their best foot, they're doing the best that they can at the moment, even though they may not be too you showing you their best side, actually according to their brain function, they're functioning at the best of their abilities at any given moment. So I have done a lot of work with the social workers and, um, and the world of SEL to bring a different approach and lens to looking at mental health and um, the brain of our children in the district mm -hmm. so far. So I will talk to you from that perspective today. Absolutely amazing. Okay, so I'm gonna... Switch slides. So before we begin, um, as I said, you know, we have expertise in the field of mental health in general, and we're, I'm, we're going to give you a definition in a minute. And parents, 
I love these two quotes, especially every home is a university and the parents are the teachers. We are our children's first teachers. Um, we'll look at later about how much time uh, we spend with our children as parents, as well as how much time our children spend in schools, but we're the first. They from birth see us, we model for them. Um, and I love this one, to be a parent is to be chief designer of a product more advanced than technology and more interesting than the greatest work of art. So true. I learn something from my children every single day. Um, my professional hat goes absolutely out the window when I'm in the presence of my children. Um, and so they do, they teach me. So I just, we wanted to get just kind of a feel for the room here and in the chat, if you wanted to as well, the expertise that you have. So how many parents here have pre-K, K, first grade? Wonderful. So there's a couple. Okay. Second, third, fourth graders. Oh, that's like a bulk of you. Wonderful. Um, and you can raise your hand multiple times because we all have, some of us have multiple children. Um, six, Ella, yeah, six, seventh, and eighth. Wonderful. Um, high school. Nice. Okay. Launched children or college age, adult, beyond. So great. Okay, so we have a lot. Anyone have zero to five? So anyone under uh, pre-K kindergarten? Okay, not in this room. Anybody online? Okay, we do get a lot of those. I'll say at Greenway, we have a, a lot of birth to five kids there and we have plenty of resources here in PV for that. And that's for a different talk. But we, oh, do. Yes, we do have one. Other oh, one. Yes. wonderful. Yes. And so, um, and so, yes, you all are our children's first teachers and things that we have at home. Okay, so I want you to think about something. I want you to think about a satisfying relationship that you have. It could be a relationship that you currently have be a relationship that you had in the past. It could be somebody who's currently living or someone who is not physically here anymore. And I want you to think about three to five characteristics of that relationship. And if you want to write them down, write them down so that you can hold them in mind for the rest of the presentation. So three to five characteristics of a satisfying relationship. And then I want you to think about how do you feel when you're with this person? Or if it's someone from your past or not with you anymore, how did you feel when you were with this person? Maybe write down two, two or three feelings. Would anyone like to share any of those? Honesty, security, humor, absolutely. Do you wanna share a feeling as well? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. Anyone else? Mm hmm It made me think of it. Just say mm hmm Do it. Exactly. You feel good. Anyone else? Yes. Communication, trust, and fun. Oh, communication, trust, fun, and you feel loved. Thank you. So I had you do this because I want us to think about how the presence of being with somebody is part of our definition of mental health and what we're going to talk about today. I'm an attachment specialist, so that is what I do. I look at relationships. I think about the interaction between individuals, whole groups, and how our interactions um, are affected by the environment and vice versa. So today we're gonna to define what we mean by, and I put these in quotation marks, 
um, mental health and emotional regulation. There is a dictionary definition. There's, um, and we're going to take this in our view and our scope of what our time is going to be today. We're going to explore what children need to be successful at school and life. We're going to talk about how the brain affects emotional regulation. We're going to think about school-based services, both in and out of the school setting. We're going to get a wonderful resource guide that our district worked in a group to put together, which is amazing. And then we're going to have a conversation. We could literally talk about this for a whole week, eight hours a day, and not like, and still not get through everything. So today in our limited time, we're barely going to skim the surface. And our goal is to start the conversation, to plant a seed so that we can continue um, to, to talk about this, to bring this into awareness. Okay, so mental health. So we tend to think about mental health as having to do with individuals and disorders. And yes, it is. It's part of what it is. But mental health is actually this large scope of our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, how we feel, and how we act. And I love this quote. You're going to see lots of these little quote things. I like these things. Um, mental health is not a destination, but a process. It's about how you drive not where you're going, okay? So um, mental health can be healthy or unhealthy, and it occurs within the context of our relationships, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, and basically the takeaway for this is that we need to be aware of, and we need to take care of our mental health. And it's not like, uh, oh, there's a disorder there, there's an other, and that's where mental health services need to be. No, we all need to focus on that. Some of those big words are like self-care. Yes, that's part of your mental health. So we need to be looking at that. We all need to be thinking about this thing. Emotional regulation. So we all have feelings. We're actually all born with every single feeling possible. <clears throat> what we're not born with is the ability to understand and cope with those feelings. And so we need to be able to A, experience the emotions and be aware and identify them. Then we need to be able to regulate these emotions and then behaviorally or what we call behaviorally to be able to respond to others and to the environment in socially and culturally appropriate ways. Um, and this is part of our mental health. So we're gonna spend a lot of focus on emotional regulation. And we all have kids and we know all of our children have really big emotions um, as a personally, yes, and as a professional, yeah, there's tons of big emotions, okay? So the takeaway from this is being able to understand that regulating does not happen on your own. It needs to first be done with a healthy, responsive other. And so we'll talk about co-regulation. And when we think about school-based mental health support, it's really the focus on having a trusted, healthy other that is there with you to help you co-regulate enough so that you can regulate and respond to the environment in a healthy and appropriate way. And you do that long enough and well enough, then that child is able to do that on their own. Will they never need help? No, because it's a continuum and it's relationship-based. So there are gonna be times, and I can think of times this morning, there were a couple of times where I was like, okay, I need to like take a breath and I need to regulate and I need to focus on what I need to focus on. Okay, um, so these happen, like I said, it's a developing capacity. So it's a continuum. It's not like, okay, I passed this milestone and now I'm this you know, number of emotional regulation. No, it's a developing capacity and it's the ability to form close and secure adult and peer relationships. It allows us to explore the environment and learn. If we're not regulated enough, we won't go out. 
and seek things out. We will not learn. Um, and it occurs within the context of our family, community, school, and culture. Before kids learn how to self-regulate, they need to experience repeated instances of co-regulation. Okay, so these are taught skills. Okay, so what do children need to be successful at school and in life? When we looked at this, <laughs> we could have put like, I think 30 or 40 slides in here. So we kind of condensed it to one slide. Um, there is a classroom um, slash life survival guide. There's a ton of research on this. Um, I'm gonna let Patricia talk to you a little bit about this, but um, this is not only an educational realm, this is also the mental health realm, the psychological realm. So it's a whole child. Life is not what it's supposed to be. It is what it is. The way you cope with it is what makes the difference. And Virginia Satir is a great psychologist. So I'm gonna let Patricia talk on this. You tell me when to put this slide. All right, so from a Brick's perspective, so every one of us have our wonderful brain and they're all different and they work on you know we have our issues with our own brain and we have our wonderful strength with our own brains and it's a whole body event it's not just a brain event and in terms of classroom readiness and being at school for those of you who have kiddos you know kind of getting into school or in it's, you know, we talk about benchmarks for them to get to pre-K, first grade, to go from one grade to the other. And, you know, that has to do with literacy and words per minute and, and how far they can count and all these things. However, um, for most of us, we learned our classroom survival skills like asking for help or listening or knowing how to ask a question on the go, on the fly. That was all part of but when kiddos are entering school now, there is an expectation that they will have some of those classroom survival skills into place. And the kids that don't have those things, you know, we talked about social norms, about relating to others, that can impact how they view themselves, you know, very, very early on and some decisions they make about themselves going forward. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, in terms of survival and skills that kids need at school, there was research done and there's a list of about 63 skills that kiddos need to survive in pre-K. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> and the degree at which these skills have to be developed increase as they go through the school years. So, but has anybody talked to you about making sure that your kiddo can manage their own anger, ignore other people's behaviors in the classroom. So we have expectations of children in the classroom nowadays that are far beyond some of the skills that they've already acquired. And we're not taking the time to teach them those things. And oftentimes the relationship with the teacher will be what bridge and the relationship with other children, what bridges the gap in order to meet those skills. And if you switch the slide, the reason why skills are so important from a brain's perspective, skills match with experience gives you the ability to predict. So if I ask you to look at this picture in terms of pattern recognition, right? What do you see? What did you say? A duck. I see a rabbit. A duck and a rabbit. Okay, so for those of you who see a duck, can you raise your hand if you see a duck? Okay. For those of you who see a rabbit? All right. So those of you who have seen the rabbit, can you see the duck? Yes. yes. And for those of you who have seen the duck, can you see the rabbit? Yes. Did I, did I get a no? Yes. Think rabbit. So these are the ears of the rabbit. <laughs> the head and the eye. Can you see it? <laughs> right? So, so this is the thing. So in a classroom of adults, right, in this setting, here we are sitting and some of us assume this was a duck, some of us assume that it was a rabbit, and some of us assume that it was both. So in terms of having the skills and the experience for kiddos to be able to recognize patterns in their relationships with 
their teacher, with the routine of the classroom, with the school culture, and all these things, it is so important for them to feel safe because the brain cannot take information. I mean, right now, as I stand in this room, my brain is calculating if I'm hungry because it's getting to that time, um, if I'm tired, how much my heels actually hurt my feet. And, you know, all this stuff is going on in the background, keeping me breathing managing this congestion that I have and making sure that I'm not hitting Nidia here as I'm walking and I have the proper volume. And all these things are happening at the same time. But since I've had the experience and the skill to talk in front of people, my brain doesn't have to notice every gesture that everyone does. If everybody is happy with what I'm saying, you know? So I can take in some of this stuff and feel safe enough to be able to provide you with this information today. However, for kiddos, you know, this might not be the case. If our kiddos don't have the skills to manage in the classroom and we give them this repeated experience that they do not have the skill to handle the classroom, their prediction model becomes school is not safe for me. Life is not safe for me. And they do this not only in the school setting, we do this all the time, right? So we're talking to you guys about, you know, this, environment that is called school, but that happens all the time. And at the end of the day, if kiddos cannot predict what's gonna happen next, how you're gonna feel when they, you know, when you come home and if the dog's gonna come and greet me and all these different things, if there's no safety, there is no learning. Because at the end of the day, learning is a performance-based output of your brain. And it is not a survival output of your brain. And essentially we have those two outputs, safety, survival or performance, that's it. And schooling ha happens in the performance side of the outputs of the brain. So if the safety pieces are not in place, kiddos have a really hard time learning. Does that make sense? Yes. So, I want to talk about this concept and kids love this concept when I talk about it. It's called the thread bucket. So the thread bucket, essentially the bucket, the bucket is your central nervous system. It is everything that you handle at any given time. So your littles have little buckets that can manage what they know and what they perceive and all this stuff. Right, and it includes their classroom, it includes their classmate, it includes their teacher, the tr trusted adult that they have at school, it includes you, it includes all the stresses that they're under, right? It includes if they slept well, if they eat, they've eaten well, if they've moved enough, right? If they have the skills to do things, if they have good relationships, if they can actually see well hear well, get good information from their touch system, right? If they can, you know, taste things well, smell things well, right? Everything goes into your thread bucket. And at any given moment, if you have too much for your thread bucket to handle, it gives you an output so that little you know, it's this pain here, but pain can be anything. We have a lot of significant amount of kiddos actually if you guys are not aware of that with physical pain. Um, it is very prevalent in my school this year. Kiddos will talk about, I have back pain, I have neck pain, which I have not heard in younger populations before. Kids just kind of brush it off, but now kids have you know shoulder pain and back pain and, and knee pain. And, and it's not, I heard myself on the playground. They are carrying physical pain, which is also a survival output of the brain. But so any of the survival output of the brain can fit there. So that might mean I can't emotionally regulate because there's too much in my bucket. It can mean I can't make friends because relationships overflow my bucket. I would rather deal with an adult. I cannot do one more day of reading because my eyes cannot work together easily enough. So I have behaviors. I avoid work. I'm stressed about my relationships at home 
and I can't focus on learning, I'm seeking adult attention. So in terms of emotional dysregulation, the big magic, when I think about it, I think about this. When the bucket is full, it is very hard for kiddos to emotionally regulate. And the only way to bring regulation is to reduce what is in the bucket. So oftentimes that piece of reducing in the school, what's in the bucket is the classroom teacher. If they have a homeroom teacher, will be their first responder to reduce the bucket. And if that doesn't work, oftentimes there'll be a mental health provider in school, whether it's your behavior intervention person, whether it's your parent in your classroom, social worker, SCL, principal, all these people are the thread bu bucket reducing, you know, um, heroes. 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 Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah. So, so when you think about emotional dysregulation, like I said, we don't have to make it very complex. Is the kiddo's thread bucket overflowing? And if you um, think about it and you see it, <laughs> some kids can very easily do this on their own, but it's only because they've had some sort of experience where they've had the support to know, oh, wait a minute, I was here before, right? That identifying emotion, I've been here. I know what this feels like in my body, I get it. I remember last time I used this strategy, I'm gonna try this again. Most of the time it, can, it works, but sometimes it doesn't. Um, and they need to, to reach out and a support can come in and say, hey, all right, let me get you back. It's a co-regulation. We're gonna keep saying that and keep saying that and keep saying that. And remember the previous slide, right? Co-regulation and regulation is, is a skill. We're not born with it. We have to learn how to do it. You have the experience, you have the skill, then you have prediction, then you have safety, right? Mm -hmm. So all these pieces kind of circle back together. Mm -hmm. It's a relationship. Yeah. <laughs> so the process is a relationship and what we do is a relationship. So I love this. We're actually um, at our school, we are using this upstairs, downstairs brain analogy. And it is a great analogy. At home, I use this and I'll ask the kids like, downstairs right now or we'll walk around um, campus and my colleagues and I will be in a conversation and go, you know what, right now I'm in my downstairs brain. Give me a minute. Um, and once I get upstairs, um, I'll be able to focus. So downstairs is all of this. And I love this graphic because it just looks so chaotic. And sometimes it really is. But I don't want us to think like emotions are bad. They're not. I even tell kids, hey, you're angry. Anger is a valid emotion. Um, it's what we do with that that makes a difference, right? Mm -hmm. So we have that emotion. And what we do with it happens over there in our upstairs brain. This, this is where learning can take place. It's the only place. What we have is this very nice staircase. And I like to think about the staircase as the connector, okay? Um, and so we can take all of this stuff. And this is all the things that we absolutely need. This also inclu includes our fight, flight, or freeze response. These are primal. You are born with all of this. The capacity to go over there is emerging, meaning it develops over time. And in fact, it doesn't actually fully develop until your 20s. And you go, whoa, okay, now college makes sense. High school makes sense to me. All right, this is why. And now we've got our little kiddos. Most of us have them pre-high school. And so what are we doing to help them build the staircase, to help reinforce the, the staircase? This is where our mental health supports come in. This is where you come in as parents. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I just 
love these two. I love Victor Grable. Um, he's a, a psychiatrist. He's a Holocaust survivor. Um, and why I put this there is because you think about these really emotionally intense things that happen in our lives and still we have an opportunity between stimulus and response. There's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Personally, my children have been through so much in the last few years. COVID, just our lives, transitions, all of these things. I want them to be able to do this. I want them to be able to be, to feel free to be who they are and to emote, to have feelings about these things. And then to be able to think about, okay, what can I do with this? How can I, if we judge it, make it for the good, make it beneficial. And I want to be able to co-regulate with them enough, my own children to help them get there. As the school social worker, and we can both attest to this, our kiddos come in and sometimes we know because we make it a practice, you know, we try to know, we know every single person's name, try to get to know every single kid on our campus. And for my kids, their social worker, I know she does that same thing. Those are important. But sometimes when they come in and we can just see what's going on in their bodies, on their face, we don't know exactly what happened. And so we want to help them to be able to do that. The other quote is about timing. And I just, I think for, for those of us who, you know, are, are more concrete, well, I don't want to say more concrete, but like you never cut down a tree in the wintertime, right? It's not good for the tree. Um, you never make a negative decision in the low time. Don't make decisions when you're emotional, right? We all know this. Never make your most important decisions when you're in the worst moods. We have to be patient. The storm will pass. The spring will come. I want the kids at Greenway to look at me like I, I'm going to help them, right? I am going to be their spring. I, I'm going to be the person who is going to be there to walk with them. Seasons, I, they evolve. So we have to get through the seasons, right? And Patricia and I talk all the time about the kiddos come in. We're going to walk with them. And we're going to support our teachers who are with them all the time to walk with these kids. And we are, and I'm, when I say we, I mean all of us as support staff, we are going to walk all together so that we can get through the seasons that are more difficult for us. And get to the better <coughs> Okay, so here's how mental health and emotional regulation affect school performance. We've been talking about this extensively. This is for your information. Basically, like we said, if you are not emotionally regulated, you cannot learn. You physically cannot learn. I, if I'm having a rough morning, guess what I forget at home? My phone. <laughs> you would think it's attached right sometimes I don't wear pockets I get annoyed that it's always in the back pocket right but yeah because remembering my phone is something I have to do upstairs all the things that I have to take with me I have forgotten my lunch and have not remembered until halfway there I'm like oh right because those two the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain they need to be connected to be able to make decisions and go through your checklist right we expect this from our kids all the time and if they're not well regulated they're not going to be able to learn so it affects energy level concentration dependability mental ability optimism and it hinders performance okay um this is from a research study in our reference list. It's in there. And so you can look it up. It's astonishing. We in the mental health community, so statistically, we talk about correlations and things like this. Um, social skills are actually a predictor, meaning if we gather data on social skills, we can predict performance and success. That for me was mind blowing. I don't know if it is for you, but like, wow, all right. Okay. So, um, mentally healthy kids get to do all of these things. 
and we're going to give you these slides. Um, they can actively engage. They're ready to learn. I mean, even as I like looked at the slide, I was like, oh, I'm so great. Okay, I'm ready. We talk about, I do a lot of work with babies, and we talk about um, interactions between mothers and babies, and babies get fussy. You can see on a brain scan, and you can see with add in a baby's body when they're in this like sweet spot, calm and alert. I can look over into the room and see the calm and alert. We can look as classroom teachers at the children. Okay, they're ready. They're calm and alert. That's, that's your sweet spot. And if you've done the practice of mental health and self-care, I'll call it that as well, then you've got a kid, an adult, a person, absolutely ready to learn. Okay. I was thinking about my life. Okay, I have two kids. I essentially work two full-time jobs because I'm at Greenway as a social worker and I have a private practice. Um, and so my kids are at school most of the day, you know, in the morning and until later. I'm at a middle school, so I start about an hour and a half to two hours earlier than they do. So like sometimes we'll see them in the morning and sometimes not. And then after school, okay, well, one day, two days a week, we've got gymnastics, then we've got ninja class, then they have after school stuff. Okay, so they're like always interacting with others. And I wanted to put this up here because just to think about, um, and a lot of this is, is averages, just something I wanted to kind of pay attention to. And so our kids spend most of the day at school, okay? And when I thought about, okay, what, um, what interactions are they having with adults and how many adults are there in their lives? Um, and I looked at what the class size was. And in elementary school, um, it's a bit better, you know, with an average of like 22 kids in the class, um, each teacher or each child will have about 12 minutes of one-on-one -on -one time with that one teacher. In the middle school and high school, so we have periods or blocks and they have to filter through and they've got walking periods and stuff like that. It's actually only two to four minutes that they get with, with that teacher. Um, as a teacher, I when I was teaching, so I was a teacher as well for like 12 years, um, I always, you know, you go, you walk around the room and you get these little kind of moments. And I'll call them moments because sometimes you can't, I mean, you just don't have the time to sit with a kid for 10, 15 minutes in a classroom, right? Um, and and so you, you do the best you can. And teachers love kids. Like I could do a whole, we could do a whole thing on how much teachers absolutely love kids. And I could do a whole thing on how much the teachers at my kids' school love all my kids. Like I, I'm like, you're safe, you're good, you know, cause, cause you guys love them. Um, so I thought this piece where like almost 40% of my kids' day is spent with peers at recess, passing periods, lunchtime. They're little. And so they're these unregulated, <laughs> dysregulated kiddos, mostly interacting with a whole bunch of unregulated, <laughs> dysregulated kiddos. I'm like, oh no, we, I, okay, I need to put some adult stuff in there. And um, this is where I think giving these kids an experience of a relationship, again, with a healthy adult, with a healthy other, can help them in these times. Now for my kids, this is much, much higher because after school, they're in gymnastics with one coach and a whole bunch of, of other children. Um, and so I wanted us to kind of look at that and see that. Okay. So school-based support. <sighs> um, again, it's about about the relationship. Patricia and I had talked to you basic physical in the brain stuff. Okay, that is what happens on the organic level. This is what it looks like. So if my brain has a good connection between downstairs and upstairs, 
if my bucket is not overflowing, I can say A, B, C. All right, this is what I can predict. And predictability equals safety. I trust you. And if I trust you, then I'm going to learn. It sounds really simple on paper, but it's actually pretty complex. And I know this because first day back, Christmas vacation, my daughter um, had a full on meltdown. She's 10 years old. Um, and I was like, okay, wait, I, I have to get to work. Like I, and so I'm in my dancer's brain. I mean, like I'm gonna get in trouble. It's my first day back. All these kids are coming back. They need to see me when they walk in. All, I'm thinking all of these things, right? And she's having a meltdown and I don't know what to do. And so I had to sit with her. I mean, I, I wanted to sit with her. I sat with her. I tried to calm her as best I could. She said, my stomach hurts, my head hurts, my everything just hurts. And I'm really nervous and, and this and that. Um, and she was able to identify feelings, which is great. I mean, we've done a lot of practice, like 10 years of this. Um, and so I got her regulated enough by co-regulating with her to say, okay, sweetie, I'm nervous so much. I gotta go. I need to go to work. Okay. So I leave, I go to work. And I um, was just like, super emotional. I think I started crying in the car. I'm a horrible mom. I should have stayed. What do I do? This and that. And I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to get to work. The second I got to work, I pulled out my phone. I emailed the social worker in SEL. SEL. You guys, Isabella is having a tough day. And all I had to write was Isabella because the background story is that the relationship that I as a mom have with that mental health support team is amazing. They're always there. My daughter came home and said, do you know that Miss Denise knows my name? I said, of course she knows your name, right? Um, and so I emailed them and I said, hey, Isabella is having a tough day today. Could you please just do something? Could you go check on her? And they know I'm a mental health professional, so I should have had like a ton of resources, right? But you don't, not, you know, as a mom, I just, if you, that goes out the window. Um, I said, can you please just go check on her? She emailed me, you know, back and she says, okay, I got it. I'm on it. So later on that day, she emails me again and says, hey, I went to go check on Isabella. She was paying attention in class. She was doing her work. I just kind of pulled her aside, see how she was doing, if she needed anything. She said, no, she was great. She was fine. Okay. I said nothing about this to Isabella. So later on that day, mind you, it was like seven, eight o'clock by the time we're all home and like done with our stuff. And I was like, hey, how was your day? I know it started off really rough. How did it go? She was like perky and like happy. <laughs> she was like, I had a great day, mom. I just needed to be back in school. <laughs> you know? And you know, Miss Denise even came and she checked on me and I was like, yeah, I'm great. I had a fabulous day. I'm so excited for work tomorrow. This is what we want, right? As a mom, I want my kids to be happy to go to school. I want them to be excited to go to school. As a professional, our goal is to get these kids, no matter what state they're in, regulated enough to go back to class, to go back to school. That, that's our role. Um, in, in our lives, um, like it was said earlier, there are going to be kids, students that we have that, you know, and I don't want to say like I'm all on one side or the other, but I feel like I'm pretty well put together that, you know, we're, we're okay. Um, there are going to be those that um, maybe are on more on the, on that side of the continuum. And then there's going to be kids, parents leave super, super early in the morning and they don't see them until super late at night and so there isn't an adult and, and we've got you know some situations going on right now as professionals where I say we're the surrogate I mean we're we're that good enough other for those kids and even though I am home a lot I still want a good enough other to be at the school with my kids 
okay? All kids need is a little help, a little hope from someone who believes in them. Okay, um, do you wanna talk about this, Lori? Sure. Okay. I will be quick because I know we're coming to the end here. Um, so um, I just want to give a little bit more of the parent perspective. You guys are awesome. This has been so great. Um, so the reciprocal support between school and home is really important. So like she was saying, that communication piece, if there's something happening within your home, if there's a divorce, if there was the, a death of a family member or a pet or something like that, that's important information to share with the mental health professionals at school and the teachers. Mm -hmm. um, and I do that too, even my kids in high school, I've got one in college and I will share that. Um, so um, be sure that you're communicating. Um, also with the school nurse, if you have a kid that has, you know, chronic stomach problems um, or other health, physical health things, we know that physical, emotional, and mental health kind of all go together. Um, so communicating those things are really important. Um, the benefits of school mental health support at home, um, obviously being social workers and counselors, um, we share a lot with our kids. Um, I do a lot of things with my kids where I will say to them, I need the time out. I need five minutes, I'll be right back. So it gives me a chance to take a breath. It gives them a chance to take a breath. I also lose my cell phone and my kids know, <laughs> and I do this all the time. Where's my phone? Where's my cell phone? Oh, mom, you're doing too much again if you've lost your phone. Um, but they know, and I know that's one of the cues for me that I need to stop. I need to regroup. I need to look at my time management. I need to, and they, they laugh at me because they know but they also know their own cues, right? I'll be like, oh, Blake, you're doing too much. You got mad because I set my cup down next to you? Wait, what? Um, so, you know, we as parents can help our kids with giving them those tools, talking to them, but I can't stress enough the communication that goes back to the school. Um, also, I love that threat bucket. Um, because kids can't learn if they're hungry. Kids can't learn if they're worried about the sick dog. Kids can't learn if they're cold or hot because they don't have the right clothing. So remember as UPC reps and PTO, PTA parent group reps that we have resources and Megan has a resource list that we're gonna share out, but um, if there are kids, whether it's your kids or your friend's kids, we've got resources to help the kids with those things, mm -hmm. right? You can't sit and learn if you don't have those basic needs met. Right. Um, there's also resources on the district website and you can always ask to talk to the mental health professional at your school for any reason. Your kid doesn't have to be in any special classes or have any special need or not. You can always email or call the school and say, hey, can I meet with the SEL specialist? Can I meet with the social worker? I, you know, I need some help. I need to talk to them about things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you one thing that I do with my kids, and then I'm going to be quiet. I've been doing this with them since they could talk. We do what's called a two-minute sleepover. And during that two-minute sleepover, it's usually at night when I'm tucking them into bed with hugs and kisses. And yes, even my college student still wants me to mm -hmm. tuck her into bed at night. But during that two minute sleepover, they can tell me anything they want. They don't get in trouble. I don't get mad and they can tell me anything. And that's when I learn all of the things that are going on. I learn a lot of things about what's stressing them out and they get to talk and I keep my mouth shut. I don't say anything. That is a time where I am listening to understand where they're coming from not to give a response. So there's different tools and things like that that you can use and you can learn. Um, you know, I'm sure we all have them, but um, the, parent, the parent communication and the parent perspective is really key mm -hmm. to this whole thing. 
And as mental health professionals, we do spend a lot of time. It's part of our, our legal and ethical guidelines to follow HIPAA. Um, and we know, and I can speak as a parent, there have been things that have happened in our lives where I'm embarrassed, maybe even slightly ashamed to share this with the world, uh, much less all of the teachers who I'm afraid are going to look at my kids differently because of this. As mental health professionals, we will hold that for you. That's part of the support staff's role is for you to be able to say, hey, Nydia, this is, or Miss Elma, this is what's going on. And we can sit and we can think about, okay, which teachers can handle this? And we, we literally just got into a conversation. Okay, this is the information that we know. Okay, how much do we tell the teachers? Because how much can the teachers hold this? Because we have to think about that. We're at, you know, we're sitting here, you know, standing here telling you about mental health supports. And remember, it's a big, huge umbrella. It's lots of people, okay? Um, for the children, our teachers, our staff, we're human. I'm part of that group. We're all human. We have stuff that goes on in our lives too. And it's so nice. I can't tell you how many times I've just sat with the teacher who's lost their mom um, or is going through something and being able to sit with them. And I hold that for them as a social worker there. Um, and so, yes, the communication is important. We know to, for us to be able to know how to help co-regulate and know that we can be very discreet and we will respect your privacy. Does that make sense? Okay, so I love this quote. Totally what <laughs> I do check in to bed. It's my favorite. Somebody on mom's group asked me, what's your favorite time of day? Morning and nighttime. So right when we wake up and right before we go to bed, because those are the times that I'm just snuggle with my kiddos. And I hopefully they'll let me do it through college. <laughs> I told them I'm gonna be the professor at their college. And they go, I'm just gonna follow them through the year. But okay, so. I realized we went over and I, that, that was my biggest fear was like, okay, we're going over. This has been great. Thank you so much. You really are truly. welcome. Thank you. Um, and this is the start of a conversation. We would be happy to be able to come back and talk about any one of these things. We could talk extensively about this. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. And this is my first. Oh, yes. Great. Welcome.